And I just want to um, start off by introducing myself. I'm Paula Stigler Granados. Uh, I'm from both Texas State University and San Diego State University. It's a long commute. Um, <laughs> I started transitioning between Texas and California right now. So um, I'm an assistant professor at San Diego State in the Department of Environmental Health and Global Health and um, an associate uh, assuming to be adjunct professor at Texas State in the School of Health Administration. I'd like to welcome you all to our first kickoff event for a One Health series on Chagas disease. Some of you may have joined us in the past for echo sessions on Chagas disease, and we've decided to go ahead and um, start a series. It's going to be a three-part series called One Health. And this, um, this session, we're going to be talking about triatamines, and the entomological aspects of this vector-borne disease. And uh, we're hoping that later in June, we will have another session, hopefully with Dr. Sarah Hamer, talking about veterinary um, health and Chagas disease. And then also, lastly, um, in July or early August, we'll have our last session on this for human health side. And we'll let you know who those speakers will be very soon. Um, but for today, let's go ahead and, uh, Carly, if you could advance the slide. Just want to do a quick disclosure. So um, we don't have any disclosures, but we need to make sure we show you this. This is a free CME session for those of you who would like CME credits. We will have an evaluation at the end of the session. Be very grateful if you could fill that out. Um, and then in about three weeks, we'll send you a certificate for the one hour CME. And our partners at South Coastal AHEC um, are the ones that help that make that happen. So thank you. Next slide, please. So briefly, we're gonna have the welcome where we're at. I'll do some brief introductions and announcements. And then we are gonna start off with having um, Dr. Gabe Hamer, and I'll introduce him here in just a moment, followed by Mr. Walter Rochelle from US Army Public Health Command. And uh, Dr. Norman Beatty will be uh, the last presenter. We do like these sessions to be interactive. So um, definitely feel free to post any questions, comments, thoughts, anything you might have in the chat feature, um, and we'll get to those as soon as we can. We will also have time for Q&A. The last part of the presentation um, is meant to be more of an um, interactive style, so we're, we'll also have a couple of polls that we're going to launch here to ask a few questions of you all throughout. So. Don't hold back with your questions. Um, if we're in the middle of a presentation, maybe wait till the end and we'll have a few times for live Q&A, but definitely put them in the chat so you don't forget them. And then we'll close out here um, at the, the end of one hour. Next slide, please. So um, I just wanted to, to briefly mention this um, before we get started to sort of tie in all these sessions and why we're doing them. Um, and, you know, vector-borne diseases have always been a One Health issue, and it's something that we're trying to sort of, especially with Chagas disease, because it does affect animals and humans, um, and with changes in climate and changes in vectors and, and, and how they act, um, this is something that really putting it under that One Health umbrella can help physicians better understand how to treat their patients, um, veterinary medicine practitioners to be able to better understand how to help their patients as well as communicate with their patients, uh, the clients of, of their patients, uh, what they could do to help protect themselves, their animals, and their families. And then also having the surveillance by our incredible entomologists um, out there in the field telling us what's going on in the world of triatamines is just this incredible, um, you know, bringing together of the, this model of One Health to help us better understand what's going on out there. So just putting that in, in perspective before we get started, I also wanted to mention that this um, is supported by um, the CDC Parasitic D uh, Diseases Branch. Um, Dr. Sue Montgomery, who runs our program for Chagas Disease, uh, is very helpful. And this is part of a cooperative agreement that we have with them uh, to be able to, to get these uh, echo sessions out there to the public. Next slide, please. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Gabe Hamer. He's an associate professor at Texas A&M University Department of Entomology. His research and teaching broadly looks at ecology and control of infectious diseases of humans, animals, uh, wild and domestic, paying particular attention to those that are transmitted by arthropod vectors like kissing bugs, um, triatomines, ticks, mosquitoes. He studied vector host interactions 
that have led to parasite amplification and increased disease risk and develops and evaluates vector control approaches aimed at reducing human and animal disease. So we're very lucky to have him here with us today. Um, he's actually in Guatemala, I presume, doing field work right now. So um, hopefully his internet connection stays solid. If um, Gabe, if you need to turn your camera off, no worries. But um, we're super happy to have him. Before we get started, though, I have two quick questions I want to ask of the audience. Um, Carly, could you launch that first poll for us? I like to do these interactive polls so we kind of gauge our audience. We, um, so you should have a question come up on your screen. How confident are you that you could identify a kissing bug, triatamine from a photo or a live specimen? And if you wouldn't mind just going ahead and um, picking one of those answers and here in about 20 seconds, we'll show what the audience responses are. And I know we've definitely got some experts in the audience. I've seen a few of you uh, who I know I call on to identify kissing bugs all the time. So let's see what the general audience is. So we have about 30% of everybody answered. So we get just a few more answers and I'll show the results. All right, go ahead, Carly. You got those results. Let's see what we have. All right, can you all see these? I can't see you, so I'm not sure. Okay, can you see the results? Yeah, all right. So completely confident, 34%. All right, we got a pretty knowledgeable crowd. So that's awesome. And we'll see how confident you still feel um, at the end. <laughs> Somewhat confident was the next percentage. And then we have one more question we're gonna ask. Carly, could you launch the, or she's launching the next poll. All right, true or false? There have been 11 different species of triatamines or kissing bugs as they're known here found in the United States. True or false? 11. Give everybody about one more minute or a few more seconds, I mean. All right, let's go ahead. You guys are quick. <laughs> let's show the answer. All right, so 79% of you did get it correct. It is true. Um, there's been 11 different species found here in the United States. So I think um, to our speakers, we have a pretty good crowd with us and uh, I think a very knowledgeable group. And then for those of you that um, may not have as much experience with kissing bugs, triatamines, we hope that you learn a lot from this session. And please, for those of you that have the expertise, um, definitely share your thoughts and questions as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Gabe, if you're ready. Great. You should be able to share screen, yeah. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Stigler Ganados for launching the session. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you great. All right, great, thanks. Um, so yeah, I'll start off this session on kissing bugs or tritamines in the United States. Okay, so I'll first just acknowledge that, hey, um, you know, a lot of th these are considered neglected vectors. Um, the, the Chagas disease is considered neglected. But in reality, the distribution of these insects is quite broad throughout the United States. So I'll come back to this later, but this are, these are data from our community science program where we've been collecting kissing bugs from the public uh, since 2013. And we've now had uh, over 8,000 submissions from 28 states. Um, just acknowledging that, yeah, from the southern half of the United States, uh, these kissing bugs do occur, and we do commonly find them infected with the agent of Chagas disease, uh, Trypanosoma macruzzi. So this, uh, taxonomically, these insects are in the order Hemiptera, so they're considered true bugs. So this is one of the uh, rare scenarios when we can actually refer to a vector, uh, a vector of human disease as being a bug. Um, because those are restricted to these, uh, the order Hemiptera, unlike mosquitoes and a lot of other vectors like ticks. Uh, they're in the family Reduvia day, so they're considered assassin bugs. Uh, but keep in mind, a lot of assassin bugs actually feed on other insects or on plants. 
And so what we really are talking about are the subfamily triatominae. So these are the um, hematophagous uh, subfamily. So it's, uh, they're obligate blood feeders, um, and they need blood at every life stage to survive and develop. Um, in the United States, we primarily have triatoma species. So that's the genus of, of these kissing bugs. Um, there's 10 species of that genus, and then there is an additional species in another genus called paratriatoma. And in fact, there's still a little bit of flux with regard to taxon taxonomy, which, which always happens. But this is what the, um, the life cycle lo looks like of these insect vectors. Um, and I'll start this video here. But basically, they start off as eggs, and then they transition through five nymphal instars. At every inf instar, they take one or more blood meals as they develop. Um, and then we see here a video of a fifth instar nymph that is molting uh, and becoming an, uh, an, ad an adult. Uh, the adult female and male uh, have fully developed wings. They're able to fly, whereas the nymphs are not able to fly. Uh, this female here has a, a tip to her abdomen, and that, that's how we know this tritoma gristecri is a female, whereas the males have this rounded abdomen. So the agent of Chagas disease is trypanosoma cruzi. We'll be hearing more about it throughout this whole series. Uh, it's broken down into seven discrete typing units or DTUs. Um, uh, they each have different uh, insect and vertebrate host associations. Um, and then also they have different uh, pathogenicities. So that's why it's important to recognize which uh, D2 you were talking about through, throughout the Americas. Uh, this would be the distribution of where we can find trypanosoma cruzi, which causes Chagas disease in humans. It's considered a neglected tropical disease. Um, and even though it uh, impacts, it's really uh, the transmission occurs just throughout the Americas. Um, there's roughly 8 million people that are found worldwide that are infected with Chagas disease, um, simply because people, of course, can become exposed in the Americas, but then travel throughout the world. And that's certainly what happens in the United States. There's an estimated 300,000 people in the U.S. that have Chagas disease, uh, most of which, of course, uh, are imported cases where they were exposed elsewhere. This protozoan blood, blood parasite is considered a generalist. Uh, so it's um, very capable of infecting a wide variety of different animals, mostly mammals, and there's been over 150 species of mammals that have been um, confirmed to be uh, susceptible to infection, and in some cases, uh, develop cardiac or gastrointestinal disease. So in terms of transmission, um, there's either vector-borne or non-vector-borne transmission. Um, so obviously, we think mostly about this vector-borne transmission involving the insect vector um, so once this insect uh, um, obtains the parasite through the blood meal, the parasite actually remains restricted to the digestive tract. Um, and the, the infectious stage of the parasite is, uh, is passed through the feces, and that is how humans or animals can be exposed through fecal contamination of the bite wound or another, orifice, uh, another mucous membrane. Um, this, trend, this mode of transmission is called sericorarian transmission, um, and it's actually very inefficient. Uh, it's, it's very low probability of a human or an animal becoming exposed uh, through this route of transmission. Um, this is not like other types of vector-borne transmission that we're more familiar with, such as um, you know, mosquitoes transmitting viruses, for example. And th in those cases, the, sal the, the salivary glands become infected with the virus, and then the, the pathogen is transmitted through the bite and through the saliva. So that's obviously a much more efficient route. But there's also these other vector-borne modes of transmission where uh, fruit can become contaminated either with the feces or with a, a ground-up uh, infected kissing bug. And then in some cases, then, that fruit can be ground up. Um, and if it's not pasteurized, uh, humans can get exposed to trypanosoma cruzi through that mode. Um, and then we also think a lot of uh, animals, both wild and domestic throughout the Americas, uh, readily consume kissing bugs. And that's also another a very efficient route of transmission uh, for trypanosoma cruzi. In terms of non-vector transmission, there are several modes. Uh, one is congenital, where um, uh, mothers can give birth to infected offspring. Uh, uh, organ donation is another route of transmission. 
uh, blood transfusions as well, which is now why all blood that's donated in the United States is screened for uh, trypanosoma cruzi. And then there can also be a uh, needle a pit, pro, uh, pokes, or um, lab-acquired infections as well. So um, in terms of these kissing bugs and where they live, there's several different scenarios where you can find these. Uh, one is referred to as sylvatic uh, uh, context. And so that is where you have wild kissing bugs living in kind of a natural habitat, feeding on wild animals. And so this occurs throughout the Americas um, and certainly uh, trypanosoma cruzi is maintained in this sylvatic cycle. Occasionally, we have kissing bugs entering what is known as the peridomestic environment around houses, um, and that's where they can feed on domestic animals and occasionally people, and we, this can occur in the United States as it does throughout the Americas. Uh, the, the additional context where kissing bugs occur would be considered a domestic colonization of the, of the human household. Um, this is uh, less common in the Americas, or at least less common in the United States, but it can be common like here in Guatemala or, or elsewhere in Central or South America. Um, and this is where uh, the adults and the nymphs are living in the walls or the roofs of a home, um, usually a lower uh, income type of community. Um, and then in that case, certainly human exposure to the kissing bugs is much higher in that context. So now just to show some maps, you know, again, Kissing bugs can occur throughout the Americas, roughly in this region that's considered red. Um, however, human Chagas disease is a little bit more restricted. Um, we don't necessarily, and in fact, this map does not really even recognize human um, Chagas disease in the United States. Um, so this is a bit of a disconnect. Um, there has been, of course, uh, some autochnigus or locally acquired uh, cases of human uh, Chagas disease in the United States. Um, so overall, um, it's nice to kind of talk about and, and learn more about this disconnect in terms of, you know, we have very widespread uh, vectors here in the United States that are in, commonly infected with trypanosoma cruzi, but we certainly have less, uh, you know, recognized human disease. And so these would just be, a, a, you know, a list of a few reasons why we might have these observations. Uh, one is simply, like I mentioned, we, in the United States, we have fewer scenarios where the home uh, is colonized by the vector. It, it can exist and it does exist, but it's certainly less common in the U.S. compared to elsewhere in the Americas. Um, certainly our homes in the U.S. are built differently than elsewhere in Latin America. Um, we'll hear more, I think, about um, the recognition of human disease and, and the potential for uh, misdiagnosis or, or under, um, uh, underdiagnosing uh, human disease in the U.S. We'll hear more about this in, the, in this seminar series. But this final one, I wanted to talk a bit more because it has to do with the uh, behavior of these insects, in particular, the feeding and defecation behavior. Uh, so it's been long been recognized that because this parasite has passed through the feces, it's really important to know when and where are these bugs pooping. Um, if they are feeding and pooping at the same time, well, then obviously that the risk of that human or animal becoming exposed is much greater. Um, but some kissing bugs actually have delayed defecation. So they, they may wait until they're, they've left the host to defecate. So that's referred to as post-feeding defecation interval. And many research groups throughout the Americas have been studying this, this aspect of kissing bug behavior for a long time. Uh, in the United States, there's kind of this recognition that our species of kissing bugs that occur in the United States have a, a delayed defecation behavior. And so this is just a, a quote coming from a, a pest, pest professional website here in the United States, and I'll read it. Um, it says, other trichotoma species, however, wait until after feeding to defecate when they are away from the host. Uh, the potential for disease transmission by these species is therefore minimal. And they say, again, it's important to point out that kissing bugs in the United States are not known to transmit Chagas disease or, organism. And so I don't know if that is an adequate characterization of the current context. And again, this comes from this kind of just this recognition where a lot of people think our species in the United States and the U.S. have this delayed defecation. And then, and then that's why we have less human disease in the U.S. compared to the Americas. But overall, there's actually not a lot of data on this context. Um, and so we, we recently comp completed a study. Uh, this would be some unpublished data. Uh, Keza Killitz in the, in the lab um, uh, did this for her master's thesis. So what we did was we had 
Um, two uh, species of tritomines found in the U.S., uh, Tritoma gerstachii and Tritoma sanguisuga. These would be a couple of the most important vectors in the U.S. And we compared their feeding and defecation behavior to Rodneus prolixus, which is a species found in Central and South America. Um, and we allowed them to feed our guinea pigs in the lab, and we recorded a lot of different dimensions of their feeding and defecation behavior. A lot, very rich data, too much to try to capture here in this short talk, but overall, uh, we did see a lot of evidence, uh, that's kind of loud, sorry, a lot of evidence of um, simultaneous feeding and defecation behavior by all three species. So that certainly would be very risky in terms of uh, that human or animal becoming exposed to the contaminated feces. Um, overall, I would say we did see evidence that Rodneus was a higher uh, or more risky vector, uh, as the literature would suggest, but I certainly would not dismiss the potential for Tritoma gristecteri, especially, but also Tritoma sanguisuga being capable of this stercorian tr transmission. So back to human disease, uh, I mentioned that a lot of uh, the recognition of human disease comes from screening uh, blood donations. And in fact, this is a map showing uh, seropositive individuals that have uh, donated blood. And as you can see, they occur throughout the United States, not just where we have um, kissing bugs and more the southern United States. So some states do uh, include Chagas disease as a reportable disease where the data is gathered and passed along to the CDC. Uh, this became, this started in, in Texas in 2013. So these are just some data uh, from 2013 to 2018 regarding human Chagas disease in the state. So there was 156 human cases of which 92 were determined to be Im imported. So uh, people were uh, acqu acquired the infection elsewhere and then traveled to Texas. Uh, but there were 26 locally acquired cases, which is pretty a significant number. And this map just documents uh, where those locally acquired cases occurred in this kind of blue uh, dashed line. So just to kind of wrap up the context in the United States, we definitely have very robust sylvatic transmission of Chagas disease where we have trypanosoma cruzi being maintained in wild kissing bugs uh, in a, with a lot of wild uh, reservoir hosts. Uh, occasionally, we have adults um, disperse and arrive and set up shop in the peri-domestic environment, where certainly uh, a lot of canine Chagas disease can occur, and occasionally human Chagas disease as well. And also, uniquely, we have a lot of uh, non-human primate research facilities in the southern United States, and a lot of these outdoor exclosures that house uh, monkeys uh, are also um, involving individuals that are getting exposed to tr trypanosoma cruzi as well. And keep in mind, uh, this is not always restricted to a low-income community. Um, there's a lot of different social demographics that, that, uh, that end up with uh, kissing bugs at their house. Um, so this is a study that Sarah Hamer uh, in our Texas a and Vet School led in South Texas, working with Italo Zeka and Rachel Curtis Robles. Um, so this is a, a study looking at uh, Chagas, uh, canine Chagas disease in low-income communities along the U.S.-Mexico border in South Texas. Um, overall, the seroprevalence rate uh, for Chagas disease ranged in these dogs from 20 to about 50 percent. So overall, pretty high evidence of exposure in these low-income communities. And again, I think we'll hear more about uh, canine um, and other forms of animal Chagas disease uh, next, next month. Um, but it's not just restricted to uh, low-income communities. So uh, Sarah Hamer as well worked with several others to uh, study Chagas disease in U.S. government working dogs. Um, and, and this is just a map showing the uh, seroprevalence of infection in these government working dogs. These would be um, uh, border patrol dogs, uh, uh, TSA dogs working at airports, et cetera. Um, and overall, the infection was... Um, uh, you know, pretty high, 7.3%, including scenarios where we have infected uh, dogs living in areas where the local vector is not even present. Um, and what this uh, acknowledges is that a lot of these dogs that are now working throughout the U.S. and even the world uh, have been trained in uh, San Antonio, where uh, Walter Rochelle will hear talk uh, in, in a moment about. Um, these dogs are trained there and also in El Paso. And during that first year of their life, uh, they're certainly at risk of getting exposed 
to, to treat Panazoma cruzi. And these are very high value do dogs and of course uh, very problematic when they're getting um, Chagas disease. So now I'll wrap up with some uh, description of different surveillance techniques. I think we'll hear more about this shortly as well. Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can um, encounter kissing bugs, uh, manual collections at night, but then also um, using lights, uh, different types of traps that, that simulate a host. Um, but overall, I would say that a lot of these collection techniques are very um, challenging. They're, they're often very um, kind of low success, I, go, I would say. Um, and so that's why early on, as we started studying the system, we realized the value of of engaging the public and, and, and embracing citizen science. And so we've been using this as a, a part of our program for a lot of years now. We have a, uh, a website, a kissingbug.tamu.edu website, where the public, when they encounter kissing bugs, they can go there and they, they submit a report. Um, they submit photos. We verify if they are indeed kissing bugs or not. Um, if they are kissing bugs, we have them ship them to our lab where we provide testing for trypanosoma cruzi. Um, the website has an interactive map. Uh, since 2013, we've had over 15,000 email conversations as we engage the public about their kissing bug encounters and, and often other topics as it relates to Chagas disease uh, with about 1,800 conversations per year. So this started with a PhD student, or at the time she was a student, uh, Rachel Curtis Robles, and now Keswick Killitz uh, manages this really large, basically an extension entomology program. So as uh, Paula mentioned, uh, one of the biggest challenges really is um, helping the public recognize what an actual kissing bug looks like. The vast majority of submissions are for non-kissing bugs, which is in many cases good news. You know, we can tell the submitter, hey, uh, you're lucky. You're, you, don't, you did not encounter a kissing bug. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of other assassin bugs. There's a lot of other true bugs um, that look very similar to kissing bugs. And, and a lot of times people are just, um, have a case of a mistaken identity. And it doesn't help when a lot of uh, media articles are released about Chagas disease or kissing bugs that unfortunately use wrong, the wrong photo. I think the reporters just, you know, Google images and, and, and pull an image that are in many cases uh, not actual, not actually kissing bugs. Um, here's just an example. These were uh, love bugs, which are actually very common in Texas. Uh, you know, love bugs sound similar to a uh, kissing bug, but unfortunately, it's actually not even the right order. These are actually true flies in the order of diptera, so it's actually the completely wrong order. And I think this kind of fuels some of the scenario where we have the public uh, seeing these insects and thinking they're uh, kissing bugs, uh, when in reality, they're not. And just along that thread, an example of what we've done as it relates to this kind of extension activity is embedding these insects in resin which provides this nice, safe platform to allow people to handle and look at these different insects uh, to help them identify them. It always helps, you know, to have them, not just an image on the internet, but actually uh, in your hand. So with these uh, kissing bugs that the public has submitted for all these years, we're able to test them for trypanosoma cruzi. Um, overall, you know, the infection uh, rates are very high. They range from 18 to 71%. Uh, for these different species. Um, overall, I think throughout the Americas, I don't think you can find a population of kissing bugs in the absence of trypanosoma cruzi. So, you know, a lot of times people are hung up on, hey, was this individual bug infected or not? But overall, I would say if you have a kissing bug present, that means uh, there's also likely trypanosoma cruzi present as well. Another little example of the value of these bugs once we have them in the lab is we can look at uh, what vertebrates they've fed on. And so this is referred to as the blood meal analysis. Uh, Sujata from the lab has a nice uh, manuscript and review right now using Amplicon deep sequencing. And the value of these molecular assays is that we can not only look at the most recent blood meal, but also some of the prior uh, blood meals. Um, and like I mentioned, by the time these uh, kissing bugs become an adult, they have fed uh, many times to achieve that adult life stage probably at least maybe 10 times or more. And each time, each time they feed on an animal, it could be the same species or it could be different species. And so this blood meal analysis technique allows us to look at the kind of the history of these blood feeding activities, which is valuable when it, when it relates to figuring out where these kissing bugs came from and then also 
looking at kind of the risk of human or canine Chagas disease. Um, and then the last little example of valuable data that comes out of this, this kind of program would be a phenology. So the, ma the majority of the kissing bugs that people encounter are the adult life stage, and it's usually associated with the adult dispersal event. Um, and so this just shows some data of, again, this adult dispersal when these adults are actually flying. Um, and there is seasonality associated with that. Um, overall, I would say uh, the adult dispersal season in, throughout the United States would be roughly April through October, depending on where you are, but it also depends on the species. And so uh, Triatoma gristecari uh, might peak roughly in June and July, whereas Triatoma sequasuga, the eastern cone nose bug, tends to be a little bit later in August and September. So that wraps up uh, my portion. Um, again, if anybody does encounter bugs, we always encourage them to go to this website and make a submission. We now have, have another, a lot of partners throughout the U.S. that are also doing similar programs. Like Dr. Beatty, we'll be hearing from him shortly. He's developing a very similar program to this in Florida. Um, so that's all I have, Paula. Paula, if you wanted to proceed to the next speaker or do a poll. Thanks. We're going to actually um, go to the next speaker, and that okay. was really wonderful. Thank you. Lots of great info there. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Walter. Uh, I know we're going to squeeze on time right now, so um, if you do have questions for Gabe, if you don't mind, and Gabe, if you have access to the chat, um, mm -hmm. please feel free to shoot him some questions. Let me see if um, Carly will pull up the slides here. And I'd like to introduce, um, go back one, I'd like to introduce Walter Rochelle. There we go. Let me close all these things on my screen so I can actually read this. So Walter, I'm, I'm really happy he's here. We um, have a great project that we collaborate on uh, doing Chagas D disease and triatamine surveillance um, in California and Texas with the Navy and the Army. He is a senior entomologist at the U.S. Army Public Health Command Central. He joined the Army as an active duty entomologist in 1998, and as a civilian, Walter has worked as an entomologist for the Navy, the US EPA, and the Army. And in his current position, he's focused on assessing the threat of neglected vector-borne disease to DOD personnel in the region west of the Mississippi. And I hope you don't mind if I say this, but I often call Walter the kissing bug whisperer because I feel like anywhere you go, you can find them. If anybody can find them, you are excellent at it. So um, with that, I will turn it over to you. You should be able to share your screen and thank you for being here. All right, can you see that? Yes, we see it and we hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if that was a compliment or not, but. I'll take that. It was meant to be a compliment. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, I'll do this really quickly so we can get to Dr. Beatty, because I'm, I'm sure he has some interesting stuff to share. Um, I just want to talk about what the DOD is doing about the uh, Chagas disease issue and um, a little background on the, on the problem. Um, in 20, 2006, there were several dogs in um, Iraq that were evacuated due to poor performance. And from um, some necropsies and some other um, techniques, they, they figured out that the dogs had E. cruzi or Chagas disease. So um, in 2007, um, they did a seroprevalence survey on 300 military working dogs. And keep in mind, there are about 900 dogs um, at the kennels at Lackland. So a small kind of subset of the dogs and they found 24 of those dogs were exposed to T. cruzi or seroprevalence, uh, seroprevalence positives. So um, I asked the uh, dog center yesterday what the numbers were as of today. And as last Friday, from January 1st to last Friday, there were seven dogs that were seroprevalence positive. So, um, you know, those numbers are, you kind of, kind of take them with a grain of salt because those dogs are moving in and out every day going to all parts of the world and then coming back. So it's kind of hard to get a real um, prevalence number. Although they do know how many dogs have Chagas, they're just not going to tell me. So um, just keep that in mind that the dogs are being in coming in contact with the um, parasite. So because of that, in 2010, we began, we, we began an intensive surveillance 
for kissing bugs at Lackman and uh, Ampolis, the JBSA Lackman area. So, you know, what did we find? Well, we found a lot of kissing bugs. Uh, the bug on the left was from the kennel, the dog kennel on Medina Annex. And the bug on the right was a uh, bug walking across the floor of a trainee tent. And the bug on the bottom was also from that same trainee tent. So we were finding lots and lots of bugs. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, one thing I want to discuss is the, um, the importance of the NEMS. I don't think people have been looking at their role in uh, maintaining the disease cycle. I don't know if you can see it, but there is a nymph right here in the center of the picture. And that looks exactly like this leaf right here. Um, I have seen a lot of nymphs just walking around in the environment. So in the military training environment, you know, are these nymphs you know, um, coming in contact with the soldiers and airmen out doing nighttime maneuvers? Um, I think that's a, that's a question that we need to look at more closely. And we plan on doing something about that um, in the near future. Um, what we've been able to do since, you know, we've got kind of a captive area, we've got around 600 acres, I think, um, where uh, it's called the Beast and Medina. Medina is the area where the dogs train. So you have dogs and human handlers. And then the Beast area is where um, the trainees, the human trainees go. So every person that comes in enlists in the Air Force goes through the Beast area. So what we were able to see um, that T. cruzi is not uniformly spread amongst the population. We have hotspots. And what's, what's kind of interesting is the hotspot at the beast were 77% positive, whereas Medina, it was around 46%. So, you know, it would have been better if they were switched around. So, but, um, you know, it's, it's interesting that we can do that again with the, with the area that's 600 acres rather than like Gabe was saying over a whole over the whole country. We can get down and look at whether or not every bug, um, every area has the same prevalence or not. And definitely they do not, there are hot spots. So what are we doing um, about the threat? Um, controlling kissing bugs around kennels is difficult because as Gabe was saying um, the bugs or the dogs can eat the bugs. So you can't spray the kennel uh, with an insecticide because the dead and dying bugs will be eaten by the, um, by the dogs. So what we've tried to do is put a pesticide impregnated net around the kennels and hopefully we will be able to intercept those bugs before they get into the kennel. And then we also um, did some habitat modification around the kennels and reduce them <laughs> reduce the, the brush area around the kennels. Now, the question is, did that work? And that's a difficult question because it's very difficult to get out and collect around the working dogs for obvious reasons. So um, we need some, some kind of passive techniques to see if these, um, if these measures are working. So we're, we're trying to work on some of those techniques now. Um, we work with a lot of collaborators, and one of the most interesting ones, um, believe it or not, comes from the Czech Republic. We have researchers that come over just about every summer, and they're looking at the microbiome of the kissing bug. And they have found that <clears throat> the microbiome is different in bugs that are positive for T. cruzi and those that are not. So the ultimate goal someday is to see if we can manipulate that microbiome to make them a less competent vector. So hopefully um, we're doing the basic science now. So um, hopefully in the near future, um, something else will come out and we could kind of move that on down, make it a, a viable option. Um, I think that's it. If you want to move on, that would be good. Great, thank you, Walter. That was really interesting. Um, I have a lot of questions for you about the hot spots. Maybe not right this minute, but. Sure. Thinking about that, um, and maybe if you have, um, maybe I'll just ask you this question. Maybe you can put it in the chat. Is 
you know, what are some of the um, factors that you think lead to having some of these hot spots? And um, maybe you could put that in the chat. That would be sure. fantastic. Carly, could you pull up the intro slides? So thank you so much, Walter. That was great. Um, and because we're running short on time, and I really hope all of you can stick around for probably another ex extra five minutes or so, because I definitely want um, Dr. Beatty to be able to get through his presentation. Um, he is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Florida, Florida College of Medicine, Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Disease and Global Medicine. He is an infectious disease um, attending physician at UF Health Shands Hospital in Gainesville, Florida, and the medical director of UF Health Travel Medicine and Tropical Disease Clinic. He's been studying the triatamine vector here in the U.S. since about 2015 and is currently working on understanding peridomestic invasion of triatamines and the risk of autochthonous or local transmission of Chagas disease in the U.S. So welcome, we welcome his expertise, and I'm just going to let you take it away. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for hanging in there and uh, joining us today for this session, and Gabe and Walter for uh, getting us started here in our discussion of triatamines, something I'm very passionate about, and Paula and the crew, thanks for putting this all together. So let me just quickly... Share my screen. Let's see. I love Zoom. Okay. There we go. Can you guys see everything? Wonderful. Yes. Well, let's 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 get at it here. So the most uh, common reason why someone will contact me or Another provider I would suggest is because of these bites, the kissing bug bites themselves. Um, the kissing bug bites um, are typically painless uh, at the time of the bite because the bug is able to secrete um, some local anesthetic into the wound. But what we find quickly uh, after the bite is that it starts uh, a local cutaneous allergic reaction. Um, you see here is a, a pretty classic example of what a kissing bug bite would look like on a Caucasian. Um, a very large erythematous welt. It's uh, oftentimes raised. And if you look and see, you'll see a little red dot there, which is the site at which the proboscis has entered the skin and has uh, uh, released some anticoagulants. So it allows the bug to, to take a uh, sufficient blood meal. What is very interesting about these bug bites is they're one of the few insects that can cause a true anaphylaxis. And um, from one of our studies in Arizona, we did find about 10% of the group who had been bitten had true anaphylaxis, which is pretty scary. Um, and here is just a, as this picture that I show commonly, but it's a, it's a, a, a patient of mine who who lived in the mountains of Arizona and had quite the experience with kissing bugs invading her home to the point where she slept under mosquito net every night. And I just remember when I took this picture, she was just so upset every day dealing with these bugs. And, and sometimes it's uh, really hard to prevent them from getting in. I've had my own experience with this. Um, this is a really uh, fun little story if you guys are interested in reading it. Um, and uh, it comes from my experience um, pretty close uh, to, being, to being bitten and to doing some field work and staying in a, a cabin out in the mountains in Arizona and thinking to myself, um, you know, that door jam looks pretty open right there. <laughs> you know, that's the light under the door from the uh, outside uh, screen porch, and um, uh, quickly realized that I was being hunted, and this was the bug that very closely got me, Triatoma recurva. But um, tri triatomines are invading our, the human dwelling space. And um, I really appreciate what Gabe um, mentioned about the kind of the peridomestic um, scenario that we're seeing in the United States, because I think that's much more common um, what we're seeing. Here we have some examples of pictures from Florida. These are patients of mine who've been bitten. The one on the left is uh, kind of a typical classic bite site where you can see the, the edema that's present, it's raised, and in the middle you'll see some erythema. And in the middle you'll see uh, that gentleman had multiple bites on his body. And those bites, those uh, little erythematous lesions lasted um, at least three weeks at the time of this picture, and they were consistently itchy throughout the whole time period. 
Um, but on the, on the top right, you see um, a patient who came who had an actual fecal drop in his bed and found the bug in his bed and was quite concerned for Chagas disease. And, and as you can see, um, you know, we believe our bugs in the United States have what we would call good manners and they are defecating away from their host, but um, that's not always the case. And so I believe, you know, um, for some reason, sometimes the bugs will truly defecate when they are feeding or taking a blood meal near us. And that is not a good thing. There's just some other examples of the bites um, that I've experienced with patients. And, you know, depending on the, on the insect itself or the situation, if it's, if it's starved of blood, um, you know, the bug will, will take multiple bites um, within the same moment. And, and with each bite, you'll see an erythematous lesion present. Sometimes they'll be raised. Sometimes they'll just be kind of a, just an itchy welt. And sometimes there'll be a nodule present, but there'll be no vesicle or drainage. Um, but it's pretty classic to see this large, red, angry welt that is hot and itchy and can persist for some time. So these are just examples. And these are reasons more commonly why people will go and see a doctor because of the bites itself. This is a patient um, who came to see me in Florida who is from Northern California and uh, actually had anaphylaxis from tritomines. It's tritoma protracta. We were able to collect bugs from his, his house and do an entomological assessment. And we did find T. cruzi among uh, two of these insects. And, um, you know, and I, and I also agree with Gabe in that, you know, wherever we find a population of tritomines, wherever they may be, there's usually, if we look hard enough, you know, our T. cruzi will be present as well. And, um, and this, unfortunate for this gentleman, uh, we, we sent off as many tests as we could for Chagas disease and they were negative. Um, but uh, he does sleep with a, an epinephrine um, pen uh, just in case he were to have another similar experience with a bite. And uh, this is a common theme in Hawaii. There's an invasive tritamine called Tritoma rubrofasciata, which is also known to cause anaphylaxis. And in this case report, we do see that individual having anaphylaxis as well. And unfortunately, there's been one known human death from anaphylaxis, which is not re really well known in the literature, but this is a case report from the American Journal of Emergency Medicine of someone uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, who presented to the emergency department um, in, in shock. And uh, the bug was presented and it was a tratamine. Um, this is not the insect, by the way. This is just a, another sample someone sent to me. But unfortunately, they did suffer a cardiac arrest from the anaphylaxis. And in my experience, um, anaphylaxis in the middle of the night is a, a very scary situation for, pa for patients. And again, this is one of the reasons why people will present to uh, a medical facility. Are they at risk for Chagas disease? That's kind of our discussion today. Um, and as, as we've uh, seen here, we have quite a bit of tritamines in the United States. The four most common bugs, as you see on this map, that would be associated with human dwellings, uh, Tritoma protracta, Rubida, Gersteckeri, and Sanguisuga, um, are found all throughout the southern portions of the United States. And new locations are being identified as we speak. This is a paper recently published from Nebraska in the uh, south uh, east portion of Nebraska, where, again, if you find the bugs, you usually find Tikuzi, and this group in Nebraska was able to show that they had a new colony that was present and surviving naturally, and there was a Tikuzi infected bug within this group. And so for me in Florida, I, uh, I grew up in Florida, went uh, off to Arizona to train, discovered Chagas disease and these fascinating bugs. And now I'm back in Florida and I couldn't wait to start investigating these bugs here. And as you would imagine, the, the research on this is limited <laughs> and hadn't been really tackled for many decades here in Florida. This is an entomological handwritten map from 1948 of the largest assessment of uh, tritamines and they were found in 32 counties. So pretty wide distribution. 
And the first infected bug and the only infected bug that's been really shown other than from the Hamer lab was here in Gainesville, Florida, right here near UF. And it was cultured from an infected bug on someone's porch. So we started looking for bugs and we knew what we were looking for. We have Tritoma sanguisuga here. We know this bug is associated with human dwellings and it wasn't soon after getting started that we were getting calls. Now, Trichoma rubrofasciata is an invasive bug and found multiple regions of the world. Um, and it's been reported in Florida, but I have not found it yet and I wanna find it, but we'll see what happens. So we started looking for our bugs. We did use multiple different scenarios, find bugs, entomological assessments, and also working with the Hamer lab here who has that amazing citizen science program that exists already. So we started finding bugs and we found plenty of these nymphs. Um, and um, we found nymphs very close to human dwellings, if not within human dwellings. And um, which is raising the question of colonization of human dwellings um, and, dom and domiciliation, which um, we do not know is occurring in the moment, but we are speculating it may in certain situations. Um, but we are finding plenty of bugs around human beings. Um, we do find them at night, and right now is a dispersal period. Um, and uh, going down to the Everglades, I was pretty sure I would find some bugs down there, but I was unsuccessful. I only found the head invasive Burmese python, which I thought was pretty exciting. But um, these bugs love to feed on whatever they can get their hands on, and um, we'll talk about that shortly. So, so far in our assessment, we have found bugs in 22 counties in Panhandle North and Central Florida. All of these bugs have been really um, mainly associated with um, human dwellings and, and the peri-domestic scenario. Um, and 309 bugs have been collected, and again, most of them were inside or outside human dwelling, and all of them were trichoma sanguis. <laughs> And so here's just a map showing what we've found so far. And as you can see, there, it's correlating with the historical distribution from some of the studies from the 1940s and 50s. And in southern Florida, which is more subtropical terrain, we have not isolated any tritamines at this time. But it's unclear whether or not we have some sampling bias. We're, we're still searching. Um, as for the amount of infected bugs, um, of, of the ones that we're able to extract DNA from 293, we found 87 positive, so 29%. And we have de uh, detected DT1 and 4, which is also uh, correlates with other studies here in the United States. So we have plenty of infected bugs here in Florida, um, just like we see in other regions of our state. So this is, uh, this is preliminary data from Dr. Nathan Burkett-Gadina and Tony Sten, and they are at the Florida Med Medical Entomology Laboratory and uh, collaborating with us as a team. And, and so far, um, what we've shown here, just from the mammalian and amphibian um, genes that we're looking for, we see quite the robust um, feeding patterns um, for these insects, including human beings as well as what we found very interesting was the southern toad, or the fowler's toad, um, but also the Virginia opossum, which is something else we are researching as a team. So as you can see, again, uh, kissing bugs will take a blood meal from anything uh, with warm blood, and we're still teasing this out as we speak. So what about octocinous disease in the United States? Well, it's been estimated um, Chagas among Latin American born residents can be anywhere from um, 230 to 300,000 or more. And uh, again, this is part of the research that I'm doing. But also, what's interesting is we have these bugs. We have infected reservoirs, vectors, they're biting people, they're associated with their homes. Do we have transmission to human beings? And, and we, you know, we, we, we see this in some isolated cases. But how rare of an event is this? Um, and as Gabe mentioned, this is a great just kind of review of all the cases that have been uh, described so far here in the United States. Um, I think it's up to 76 or 77 cases so far, 78 most recent case. 
But as you can see, um, multiple states have had uh, multiple reported case reports and some small case series of infection associated here in the United States and was believed to have been acquired here in the United States. Um, this is a great paper from Melissa, uh, Melissa Nolan now, who uh, really kind of unearthed uh, the beginning uh, of octopus transmission here in the states, especially in Texas. And, you know, I would say that Texas is leading the way here for investigating Chagas disease in the United States. Um, as we can see with these 11 cases that were isolated from the blood donation uh, system, these cases, you know, there's not really a slam dunk association with tritamines um, and or any one risk factor. As you can see here from this table, you know, some had uh, lived in rural settings, some had you know, some exposure to occupation or camping, some had known exposure to tritamines, but some did not. And, and just begs the question of, you know, in the United States, how is transmission uh, occurring? And I really appreciate Walter's comment on those nymphs because they can't fly, but they will definitely walk um, uh, to find or crawl to find a blood meal. And, um, and what are they doing in the environment? You know, are they defecating in our local environment? And is Tikuzi in the soil? I don't really think we have a good understanding of what's going on here. Um, for me, you know, in Arizona, uh, we, were, we were running a citizen science program as well, and we came across this case of a young lady who uh, was in high school who donated blood at her local high school and came back with these positive tests and reached out to us and said, hey, what is Chagas disease? I had no idea. And so, of course, I got very excited and, and started to investigate this case. And, and sure enough, we found that she was likely um, an, the first really well-documented octopus in this case in Arizona. These are some pictures that um, were actually from me finding bugs at her home, which we did, and, and those bugs were all positive. And we also did find a nymph inside her home as well. Um, but again, she did not have any known exposure uh, uh, to the bug itself, just finding them in and around her home. And there are some recent cases that have been described. Um, the one from Missouri, which um, uh, was kind of an interesting case, again, also identified through blood donation and uh, really great entomological and epidemiological assessment. Um, uh, really didn't show any risk factors for, for why this person had Chagas disease other than you know, living in um, kind of rural settings, but no known exposure to bugs um, to the best of that person's knowledge, and, um, but definitely had positive tests uh, at the CDC, as well as this really interesting case that has just been published um, of acute Chagas disease and, and, and a gentleman who worked um, on a ranch in, in Texas and really had, again, no exposure to tritamines that he was aware of, but came down with um, what we believe is Romagna sign and an, an unresolving erythematous uh, paraorbital edema that um, they discovered T. cruzi in his blood on PCR from broad-based molecular testing. And again, you know, we, we asked the question, how are tritamines involved in the transmission to humans in the United States? And, you know, is there um, some other transmissible moments that we're unaware of? But our bugs are definitely positive wherever we look. So here in the United States, um, a panel uh, of experts have come together to, to really dive into screening for Chagas disease. And um, it took us some time to come up with these recommendations, but uh, I think they really um, bode to the need for us to start looking for Chagas disease here in the United States among those who are at risk so that we can identify cases and link them to care as soon as possible. Who should be screened? And as you would imagine, um, you know, our, our purpose for our talk today is, is, is talking about those exposed to tritamines. You know, among the panel, there's a lot of research that needs to be done, um, but we felt strongly that if you had a known exposure and you had an entomological confirmation of this bug and biting or within your home, that you should consider screening and discuss it with your doctor. But, you know, the evidence is limited, uh, as you can see, and it is a conditional uh, recommendation uh, at this time. And, 
you know, in the United States, we have tests that are available commercially. Um, the two most commonly used tests are found at Quest Diagnostics and other commercial laboratories, including Arup and the, the Wiener and the Humagen tests are a rather good test. Um, you know, you may see false positive tests sometimes, um, and we really don't understand the rates of false negative. But the important thing is, is it's getting someone screened for Chagas disease. And in my experience, um, the cases, uh, you know, of, of close in this transmission here in the States have had positive um, screening assays uh, with the wean and the imogen. Um, the NBIOS rapid uh, Chagas detect uh, the rapid lateral flow assay, which you see here on the right, this is actually some pictures from the Arizona case where she had positive in bios testing and uh, with two of her family members, as you can see, are negative. Uh, this test is, is a really sensitive test, and I think it's, it, it uh, has utility in certain clinics and certain situations for mobile health, uh, but it's not widely available in the moment. And, and lastly, the two tests that we use for the blood banks are different tests, and, um, and they are very, very sensitive, and so sensitive that there are, there are a fair amounts of false positive assays, but um, they do protect our, our blood donation system in the United States from transfusion-related chagas disease. So lastly, our most important thing to do at this time is to get confirmatory testing done at the CDC. Uh, we screen someone with a commercial assay, it is positive. We will contact uh, our CDC officials to set up for the confirmatory testing that is available. And this is just a, an example of a positive test that, uh, on one of my patients here. And um, the most important thing is at this time, you know, this is uh, our laboratory of choice and our, uh, our way at which we confirm a diagnosis of Chagas here in the United States. And lastly, um, just I wish I want to acknowledge all the all the people who work with me here in Florida, and you know, we're all pretty dedicated to Chagas disease, and excited to see others do the same. You know, uh, like, like like what's been mentioned, this is a neglected disease. It's a neglected tropical disease. It really needs attention, and and hopefully we can continue to raise awareness and uh, screen people who are at risk for for this disease. So um, happy belated Chagas Day and um, thanks for listening everyone and hanging in there. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Beattie. That was fantastic. And I know we're about um, about six or seven minutes over the hour. So I appreciate you all hanging in there with us. Um, I tell you what, uh, what we could do right now is Carly, if you could just throw up our last slide, that I think might have some contact information, a couple of things. We will have this um, session recorded. And we will um, post that on our website probably in a couple of a, a week or two. Give us a little time. CME certificates will go out. We definitely need you to fill out those evaluations. They're quick, you know, not too, too complicated. Um, I want to thank everybody who was here, especially our speakers, uh, for, for giving their time. We spent a lot of time preparing for this, and we're really grateful for you and all your work that you're doing. Um, if we have a few minutes, if anybody wants to stick around for a couple of last minute questions, we'll happily stick around for a few more minutes. Um, but thank you all so much. And feel free to reach out to us. We have this chagasus at gmail.com or I'll still put my um, work email in the chat. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have questions. I also posted Dr. Hamer's website. Um, I'm sure they'll gladly take your bugs. If you're in Texas and you find a bug in your house, you can always send them to the state health department. But if you find them um, outside of your house, feel free to send them in to get tested. And um, with that, we'll just uh, stick around for a few minutes, see if anybody has any questions. Otherwise, we appreciate everybody coming and hope to see you at the next session in June. Thanks. Any questions? I have one, if that'd be okay. Yeah. I'll do some video just real quick. What do you think the role is for congenital transmission? If we have, you know, we can look for bugs if we find autonomous infections. If we don't find bugs and we can't justify the infection, I know when we've done these studies in mice, we found certain strains of the parasite were more likely congenitally transferred than others. So. 
Do you think that's a, a, a legitimate thing to consider when we're looking at human infections? Uh, yeah, thanks, Chris, for that comment. Um, sure. And I think congenital con infection is, is extremely important. And the reason is this. Um, if you do discover a case of congenital transmission, you, know, you can cure that infant of Chagas disease with treatment. Mm -hmm. um, we do know that uh, an infected mom to baby transfer of infection is anywhere from 1% to 5%. In some regions of Bolivia, maybe a little higher. But the most important thing is, is being able to cure the disease. And, and, you know, we do see, you know, I've had patients who are, who are in their 20s who are now showing signs of Chagas heart disease. And, uh, you know, once we get to those stages, it's a little bit harder to manage. Sure. Um, as for congenital transmission in the United States from octothenous transmission, I mean, that is a huge black box, uh, a void of information. You know, we, we really don't even understand what transmission is like in the States right now. But is it possible for transmission? I think it's possible. It's probably rare, I would say. But among Latin American immigrants uh, who are coming from endemic regions, I think it's very important. And there's, there's a good amount of data to suggest that it does show um, there's efficacy in, in screening uh, uh, pregnant women um, because we can cure Chagas disease, and, as mentioned. So mm -hmm. does that answer your question? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. I'm just, I was, uh, because we've, we found, and I'll maybe drop you an email on this, just that the, the strain of the, the cruzy parasite we find in possums, uh, that's the one we typically find in bugs, although we have a higher prevalence in raccoons, but we don't find that isolate as much. Where are you located? Uh, up in Rome, Georgia, but I've primarily worked down along the, actually, North Florida and okay. along the Georgia coast. Yeah, we're right in the same neck of woods. Yeah, we, we're, you know, the, uh, the wildlife stuff we're doing right now is very interesting, and um, we are finding something different. Um, but I agree with you that there's different strains that have different propensities for different mammals and different mm -hmm. uh, hosts. Um, and, and how does that correlate to the human being? Yeah, we, we don't know. We really don't know. In parts of South America, like in Colombia, where I'm working, it's the same discussion. You know, they have different DTUs, there are different strains in different populations that are showing clinical disease versus non-clinical disease, but they're still infected. So right. there's a lot to know here. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> Whole lifetime's worth of research. Right. Well, thank you. Feel free to shoot me an email since you're close and we can talk about sure. what we're doing. Right. Great question. And Chris, we're also um, in Texas, we're working on a newborn screening study. Where we're looking at dried blood spots of babies to pick up the antibodies of the moms just to mm -hmm. do a prevalence. So hopefully we get about 30,000 samples. So we have a better idea of prevalence amongst um, women who've given birth in Texas. It'll That'd kind of give great. us a better idea. Yeah. No so doubt. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's a kind of a low-hanging fruit to to, to um, test those newborn drag blood spots since everybody's doing it and, you know, mm -hmm. you can access them. But getting a state to say, okay, we'll add that to our screening program uh, could take a long time, quite a bit of effort and a lot of proof that it's necessary. True. Uh, well, good luck with that. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Comments? Well, I can tell it's been very useful, uh, a lot of contacts. I've kind of dropped off the radar lately, so I'm, I'm anxious to talk to some of these people again. Yes, a lot of people, rec names I recognize now that we're here today. It's great to see people here. All right, well, if, you, if anybody has any further questions or thoughts or comments, feel free to contact any of the speakers or myself. Be more than happy to um, answer those questions. Send us your bug pictures, whatever you need. Most of you already know how to identify, so maybe I'll call you up so you can identify all the bugs we get sent to us as well. So um, thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you soon. We'll send out more information on our next session. Uh, you have the link to our website for the UT Health Echo series. And as soon as we get the dates nailed down, um, we'll send out a flyer with more information. So thank you all for being here.